Char Stiles is an artist, educator, and programmer based in Brooklyn, New York, and the creator of the collaborative Shader.Place arts programming environment. She works creatively in the lower levels of computational systems to bring to light how computers work. Char works and collaborates across media such as interactive installation, video, performance, and the web. She's a part of the LiveCode.New York City Collective, where she organizes shows and live codes music and visuals. She has live coded for Alexander Wang, VIA Festival, and the School for Poetic Computation, among others. She holds a hybrid Bachelor of Computer Science and Art from Carnegie Mellon University, and she can be found online at charstyles.com. Char Styles. Hi. Oh, I'm so good. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so, hi, everyone. That was a great intro, Golan. Uh, I honestly, you made me sound really awesome. So it made me feel like, oh, maybe this is uh, this talk is going to be going to be nice. OK, cool. So hi, I'm Shar. I am a avid life coder and a online workshop teacher. Those are the two identities I'm taking on for this talk because it's very contained. I'm just going to talk about those two parts of my work. So what is life coding? Um, Live coding is where, oh, let me share my audio. What is the thing I forgot to do? Live coding is where. Um, uh, should, we, should we be hearing the, the screen? Uh, yeah, I'm going to share my, my audio one second. Mm -hmm. I just have to look at it. Share sound. Awesome. Can you hear that? No, nope, not yet. Ah, uh, less. Uh, I think. Hmm. How could it be? Yeah, I hear that. Ah. Well, it's not muted. That's all right. Um, the music is very nice. It's by Terra X Locks, so we'll just have to do without it. Um. So. Anyways. Uh, live coding is is where uh, a two programmers, one to create music and one to create visuals, will be on stage or uh, live streaming uh, code that will create uh, music and code that will create visuals alongside it. And as you can see on the screen, we will also display the code as it's uh, as what it is compiled to is creating the sound and the music. So it creates this one to one uh, transparency of like the code that you're seeing is exactly what your uh, uh, what you're experiencing. So it's presented as something that is entertaining in performances called algo raves, which is a portmanteau of algorithm and rave. Um, when I recently described it to someone who is interviewing me, he said, that sounds like something a Hollywood director would make up that programmers do, but they don't actually do it. And that is very <laughs> There's a good reason why one would think that is because it seems like a logistical nightmare, and it is um, because as a lot of programmers here know, and other folks who work with technology in general, it, tech just does not want to play nice live, especially when you have multiple types of inputs with like experimental tools, exactly what live coding is. Um, it sounds cool on paper, but when you actually do it, there's just like a ton of problems and mistakes. And that's just like part of the uh, the identity of the life coding community. I did not make up life coding. Uh, there is a community uh, all over the world. It's mostly in Europe, but we also have our uh, our small community in uh, in New York. And we have our website. It's our website, livecode.nyc, where we uh, put on shows and we have a Discord that you can join all of our meetups are virtual, but we are very welcome, welcoming to newcomers and anyone who wants to dabble in anything that's kind of like live compiling code. So it doesn't necessarily have to be live, like continually live compiling code. But if it's something that's kind of on a computer that makes sound or music, we accept you. <laughs> um, so now you know uh, what live coding is. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk about my next part of my identity, which is a uh, work workshop teacher. So I love to teach all of the um, all of the uh, things that I do on stage because naturally the questions are uh, when I'm coding it. There are a lot of questions of like how I'm doing it, what are you doing, and so I love explaining it. So I just started 
teaching these workshops, especially uh, once the pandemic started, I started teaching them online and a lot of folks from all over the world were able to uh, come and join and, and learn about what live coding is. Specifically, a technique that I like to teach is a process called ray marching, which is uh, what you saw in the last video. A lot of the uh, shapes that you saw were ray marching, and uh, Reza briefly mentioned ray marching uh, in uh, uh, in satin. So it's 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 a way to create a three D scene in just one fragment shader. It teaches uh, programming concepts like signal processing as well as uh, as like functional programming because you're basically writing code for every single pixel on the screen all at, that, that's being rendered all at once. Um, I, um, I also love it because it's kind of like I like to call it like pseudo uh, physically based rendering because it follows the ray of light similar to how photons bounce around in the real world. Uh, these are just images that I made uh, for the workshop. I teach a workshop on ray marching specifically, like I said. Um, and so the ray of light follows uh, the path that a photon would bounce around uh, in the real world because uh, you know there's already these kind of formulas that physics has given us to uh, calculate what a color should be when a when a light hits it a certain way. But instead of it actually working like photons, so photons the the light the uh, ray comes from the light source, bounces around, and hits our eyes. Ray marching works that the uh, ray comes from the viewer, bounces around, and hits something, and then it returns the color of that something. I mention this because this is actually how Plato thought vision worked. Um, it's called emissive theory, and they thought that um, eye feelers would come out of your eyes and to bounce around and then tell your brain what was in front of you because of your eye feelers. Um, <laughs> it was Euclid who came around and thought, hmm, you know, if that was true, it would probably take us a while for our eye feelers to go to the stars and we wouldn't see the stars right away if we like close our eyes and open our eyes. Our eye feeler feelers would have to travel a little ways before hitting the stars. Uh, so he concluded that it is light photons emitting from a light source coming into our eyes. So that's just a little <laughs> reason why I love ray marching. It is kind of like uh, you can, because it's like sort of physically based, you can make things look like they're going to go physically based and then you can totally like veer off into a bush and, and uh, really mess with, with folks' perception. So that's another reason why I love performing with ray marching. Um, some, uh, I want to show you some work that my students have made throughout the, the uh, pandemic. This is a wonderful, wonderful show um, in newart.city where um, all of these shaders are running, <laughs> are running real time in my browser. I'm laughing because I'm like running Zoom and I'm like running all these shaders and I have another shader running in like another tab. Um, and let's pray for my computer. Uh, but all of these are uh, examples of work that my students have made uh, throughout the work, and I'm so proud of them. You can see in the bottom right corner the, uh, the um, credit. So this is by Adele Lin. And, uh, you know, we have like um, shaders from like 2D shaders. So like right here, it's, a, it's a, from a 2D shader workshop to 3D shaders. This one looks like a beautiful ocean. I wish that I, my talk could just be like annotating and going through all of the students' works because I love it all so much. Like, there's a lot of really great expression coming from, like just, just from like an hour's workshop of uh, you know, really, uh, really beautiful work. And I, I love being able to, to, to kind of teach these workshops haphazardly or, you know, like just, from whoever's on, online, because everyone comes with different, with a different base of knowledge that they bring to uh, the, the workshop. So for example, I didn't teach any kind of algorithm like this, but maybe Kurt had uh, an idea of an algorithm that they wanted to use in their shader and they're able to apply that. So I'm just all for one room schoolhouses. Um, back to presenter here. And um, there's another video of just some of the work that, that students have done uh, throughout the time. It's been uh, 
just really amazing to be able to meet everyone who is interested in uh, coding shaders and where they come from and be able to kind of uh, just teach the little bit that I know to them. Uh, we even had a show in Minecraft. Uh, it's less exciting because the shaders were not able to live compile, but I wanted to show it regardless because, you know, it's in Minecraft and it has that going for it. <laughs> um, okay, so now you know a little bit about my background. Uh, the project, let's talk about Shader Place. Um, so Shader Place, I just, I'm actually just going to show you a demo. Um, I'm going to go right in it. Um, it is a live coder, live coding editor. So to prove it, if I go here and I, uh, you know, delete, have this piece of code that I prepared <laughs> and I uncommented back in, that's how a lot of live coding works sometimes. Um, we have, uh, we have the shader updated automatic, automatically in the background. Um, and so this can be used uh, as a performance tool, but the thing that, uh, is unique about it is if, somewhere someone were to uh, log on like on another computer say a computer right here uh using the same password which i uh the room name which i'm not going to say until a little bit later they can also go in and let's see where am i let's say i wanted to make the sphere up here so you see this user mouse that's me that's another shard that's another shard that's right here on this computer I can make the sphere bigger um, by simply changing the code. Uh, let's make it like nine. Oh, that's way too big, six. And then the sphere is gigantic. Um, and this is all happening real time. Um, <laughs> and, and if anyone wants to come in now that I proved it, the password is OSSTA, you go to shader place um, and you can enter the room name, which is OSSTA, all lowercase. And you can have at it. I'll let, I'll leave this shader tab open, and I'll uh, we'll see. I'll see if anyone uh, <laughs> anyone changes anything at the end. I see I see folks in there already. Wait, <laughs> here we go. Another user. There's a lot that I want to uh, work on this app. I started creating this app actually just at the beginning of the residency. Um, I uh, was obviously very uh, motivated by, yes, oh my gosh, it's happening. The collaboration is happening. Um, but anyways, let's, let me continue my presentation and then we'll, we'll come back to it. Um, so yeah, why did I do this? Why another shader editor? Um, and Reza actually also touched on this in his last talk. And, and I'm really surprised that he was saying that he was reinventing the wheel because I think that what he's doing is very different. But maybe, you know, I guess that's just how we all feel when we're making tools. You know, there are already tools that are out there. Um, but why do you make your own tool? Um, you know, because there's the Shader Toy by Inigo Quiles, there's Shader Booth by Max Baker, which is amazing. Um, there's GLSL Viewer by Batteries View. Um, so why, why another shader place? Well, I think that there's something to building. Uh, there's something nice to building something that is a perfect tool for you in your own circle. Um, it, so this is uh, someone, uh, let's see if this is gonna work. No, oh, that's, I have the video. Oh, I don't have the video, I thought I had it. Oh, I have it here. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, oh, I guess I deleted the video. That's all right. Um, but Eliza, who is a, a host for a uh, Twitch stream called Curiously Minded, where um, Eliza and Elithia, who are uh, the two programmers on the top and the bottom, create a shader together. Uh, on live on on Twitch, and they invited me to uh, show Shader Place as they used it to uh, create a shader together. Um, Eliza made a really nice uh, video. I'm just going to show, that, I guess, a little clip of it. Um, I'm sad that that the that the the sizzle reel of the <laughs> of the uh, workshop didn't make it in my presentation, but basically, um, it was a really special moment for me and it was so from my favorite moment of creating shader place because Alithia and eliza had met at one of my workshops and uh it was kind of like a full circle moment 
or then we all got together and uh, just as friends to uh, create something together. We never met in real life. It's very much like a pandemic friendship. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at Shader Place as it's happening. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that, that's, that's the reason why uh, I wanted to make Shader Place. And also, because making a tool and reinventing the wheel is, uh, you know, making a tool that only works for you and your friends, and you know that it will work for you. That's really the only way to start making tools. Before you can make tools for anyone else, you have to know what it's like to be the person who is receiving the tool that is being made. Uh, so this is my one of my first uh, open source tools that I'm creating. Uh, and so it's it's been like a very uh, well I I've made some some other stuff but it's like the the tool that I really want to uh, that that I'm making it nice so that other people can be able to contribute to it um, another tool so another tool that I uh, uh, co-created with Chirag uh, David uh, we we created a tool together called Carl which stands for Code Augmented Reality Live. Um, so basically how this works is that you code and then the code gets sent to, uh, it gets broadcast to everyone who connects to the server on their phone. And then they can see the uh, updates to the shader live in AR. And so I, I, I like how, how when you start just making tools for yourself, they kind of roll into each other and they inspire each other to, to become, uh, you know, bigger and better. So just the kind of tool chains of, of tools. <laughs> Um, and that, yeah. Oh, and I have a um, upcoming class. I don't have a, a, the, the link minified yet, um, but if, uh, if you sign up to my email list, I'll send the, 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 lit, the, um, the with friends lit, uh, link to sign up. Um, it's, this is just a, a class that will go over the fundamentals of 2D shader programming. Uh, it is recommended that you have some programming experience, um, but some folks have gotten through the workshop with having no programming experience and it's been, it's been okay, <laughs> but recommended that you have some programming experience. It's on June 5th, uh, and maybe I'll put the, the link. I was debating if I should even put this in, but I, I guess, oops, I guess, um, So that, that's a link for the to sign up for the workshop. And this was not a this presentation wasn't a whole lot of boost to get everyone to sign up for my workshop. <laughs> um, anyways, I uh, thank you so much to uh, to the studio for creative inquiry for uh, having me, and uh, thank you to the other residents for being so inspiring. Charlotte, <clears throat> thank you so much um, for this presentation. I'm immensely proud as someone who was was your your teacher a few years ago and um also uh, it's just been great to have you back at carnegie mellon and back at the studio to kind of continue your work beyond school um i have a a question which is um uh you you like teaching i know you, you and you you work in several different collectives artist collectives including several you didn't even mention here yeah <laughs> Um, uh, uh, and you've made a collaborative shader editor. Um, I don't know, you were for a while at the Recurse Center, and I don't know if you had a chance there to experience pair coding. Right. Uh, um, I wonder if you could talk about your relationship to the social dimension of computing, to the, uh, I, like, of like thinking through code with other people mm. at the same time. Right. So all code, when you're coding, is thinking through code with other people. The only scale is different is time. Perhaps you're thinking through code with someone who created the email protocol in 1971, but you're still thinking, um, you're still, I'm just trying to say that all code is a product of like a human thought. And so we think about code as these things that are, are have like some sort of like related to like a law of physics. Like the reason why SMTP is like that is because it's like the law of physics or something like that, but it's not. It's because a lot of, because people 10, 20, years ago made the decision like that and i bet a lot of <laughs> web programmers 
agree with me because I think that's a lot of the web is that you're you're working with code uh, from uh, that people have made. It's just grand grandfathered in. Um, and so I think I think all coding is pair programming, even if you're coding by yourself. I think that uh, if we start treating it that way, it will make coding a little easier. And also, I wanted to quote or loosely quote a tweet that I saw the other day by Emma Ray Norton. And uh, they tweeted that what if anyone was able to create their own programming language and they could have a the print function be called something like, why is it like this? Or what the fuck? And if someone was able to create a print statement with a function that just makes sense to them, they understand that it doesn't have to be console.log. You know, it doesn't have to be C out. Um, so I think that um, as, as long as, you know, I, I think that the exploration of, of learning how to code is continually just learning how to uh, you know, code the environment around you in general, just to kind of long-windedly answer your question. Um, there's another question from the YouTube chat. Um, uh, I, I, I even remember there was, I, I remember the, when you first took a class with me years and years and years ago, um, you had not yet learned to code. Mm -hmm. And the question that someone asks is, uh, what was the biggest challenge that you faced uh, while learning to code for creative projects? And I mean, you were always coding for creative projects that you, you, your, your, your baptism in, in, in coding was in creative coding. Mm -hmm. but, but what was the, the challenges that you faced as a beginning programmer? Oh, as a beginning programmer, the challenges that I faced was figuring out what belonged to the computer and what belonged to, you know, variables that, that we would make and like what levels of that, because it's like we have different levels of like what belongs to the computer. So we have like system variables and then we have, um, you know, from the whatever API or wrapper you're using and then um, from the variables that you define yourself or maybe like you're using another library, like who, what belongs to who? Because the, the truth is, is that it's all murky and, and like nothing really belongs to anyone, but we create these boundaries to, I guess, create a meaning out of complexity. So I, that was something that was really difficult for me. And also just remembering to put the semicolon down. So 